find out in a moment if it's long enough. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Mortman. I'm your uh, privacy wonk for the afternoon. I uh, hope you all had a safe trip in with all the rain and all that good stuff. And um, so let me just give you a little, uh, oh, I keep changing my name here. Um, so basically what we're going to talk today about is something about some uh, privacy regulations, and then we'll talk about what this means to us and what can we do about things to uh, either improve things, make things worse, or whatever else you have questions about privacy, not privacy, I don't care. I'll talk about anything. Okay, so uh, who here has heard of CA 1386? Anyone? Okay, we have a couple of people here. So basically, uh, about four or five years ago, California passed a law that said that if companies have some sort of breach uh, of your personal information, they have to let you know. So probably at this point, everyone in this room has gotten at least one, if not dozens of letters from various companies saying, Oops, uh, we, we lost a hard drive, we lost a laptop, we had hackers, you name it, they screwed up, and your personal information has been put somewhere on the internet, in people's houses. Uh, my personal favorite was, actually happened to a friend of mine, she started getting faxes at her house of people's medical records because someone uh, transposed two, the last two digits in a fax number, so she started getting people's um, personal medical records from all over the place because it was from a major healthcare provider who uh, handles several states. So she knows people's HIV status now, um, what kinds of cancer they have, all sorts of uh, yummy things. And it took her several weeks of calling to get them to actually fix the problem. Um, and so fortunately, she's a very nice person and has a paper shredder and just uh, stuffed all that stuff down the shredder. Unfortunately, she couldn't actually turn her fax machine off because she needed it for her business. So it, uh, it was an exciting time and involved a lot of uh, wasted paper, not to mention uh, all sorts of exciting information that she now knows about maybe someone in this room. So <clears throat> California started doing this, and as of the end of last year, some 39 states have passed similar laws, which has sort of shown us the, uh, you know, I've seen probably an exponential increase in the number of these letters, emails, advertisements on the sides of buses about this problem. And in fact, uh, Recently, um, Minnesota actually went even further, which was they made your credit card numbers fall into this information. They codified parts of the PCI legislation, which is, uh, for those people who aren't familiar with it, makes um, all the vendors, anyone who deals with your credit card number in any way, shape, or form, go through all sorts of um, extra hoops to protect that data, which uh, actually ends up putting a lot of effort, a lot of uh, Wait, especially on smaller providers of things. So you know, if you go to your little mom and pop store down the street and they swipe your credit card number, they have all sorts of things they need to follow, like storing credit card receipts for months on end, just in case something happens. Of course, this also means that as a result, if someone breaks into the, your, their offices and steals things, they now have months of customers' credit card numbers at their disposal. So there's been a lot of arguing back and forth between vendors and the credit card company is over what is actually the right thing to do and what provides the customers with the most protection as opposed to what protects Visa and MasterCard. So for the people who actually need this, I just put together a quick little list. These are uh, some web pages here. The slides will be posted online at some point through Nauticon. And these just have long lists of the various privacy legislations, both in the US and around the world. So for the people who need to know this, for work-related stuff, these are some great resources. So meanwhile, um, as I was talking about before, the uh, laws we we're talking about were all state level, so it varies, the rules vary from state to state. Some things say things about encryption, some things say things don't say anything about encryption. Some states require central reporting of this information, some don't, so um, it's getting very complicated. It's pissing people off, both at you know our side as the people who are the recipients of these letters, as well as companies. You know, 
large companies tend to deal in multiple states, and in fact, some of these laws are actually indirect uh, contrast with each other, which means you have to choose, well, which states am I actually going to be compliant with with this law? So uh, there's been a lot of effort at the federal level to come up with one overarching law for the entire U.S. that would cover who, you know, when do you send out breach notification letters, how do you send them out, what, what are the rules for that? But so far, they've all pretty much died um, in committee, either in the House of Representatives or the Senate. Um, it's not, despite the sort of chattering of various Congress critters, it actually does not appear to be a high priority. So as a result, um, it never actually gets enough attention to make progress forward. This would be great if I need a nap. Um, so in addition to the stuff about breaches, when I'm not really going to talk much more about that, there have been several other pieces of legislation dedicated to uh, protecting uh, your personal information, most notably uh, GLBA, which is a banking legislation which, prote- which um, mandates that the banks protect your personal financial information to a certain extent, um, and HIPAA, which is supposed to protect your healthcare information but doesn't actually really do much aside from make auditors have more checklists to go through when they work with hospitals and doctor's offices and, what's not, and whatnot. Now, probably of more interest to this crowd is actually the Patriot Act, FISA, KILEA, and, uh, ooh, mood, uh, legislation like that. Now, the Patriot Act, um, I think, I'm assuming that everyone's heard of the Patriot Act um, in here. Uh, and the most, you know, the big thing about the Patriot Act is it allows for warrantless searches of anything, whether it's your computers, your paper records, your house, your place of business, um, with no actual right to protest it, to appeal it, or even to tell anyone else about it that it even happened under what they're calling uh, national security letters. And it's been really hard to figure out what's been going on, but enough information has leaked out to show that the FBI, amongst others, has actually been seriously abusing this power and using it outside the scope of what they're supposed to uh, under the letter of the law, it's only supposed to be used for investigating terrorism, but it's actually been shown to be used for all sorts of other things because there are no checks and balances for this. Um, and speaking of sort of warrantless stuff, what's not on here is, uh, it's not legislation, which is why it's not on the chart, but there's been obviously the uh, NSA has it's been doing its wa- uh, warrantless wiretapping stuff, which relates to FISA in that they're claiming that the FISA court system is not sufficiently uh, isn't fast enough to actually provide them with wiretaps when they need them. Now, FISA was put in place after the Nixon administration to ensure that um, there were cases where there needed to be a warrant issued for a wiretap where that that warrant information couldn't be public information because it might put the investigation at risk. Now, the important thing about it is that you're supposed to go to the FISA court, get a warrant, do your wiretaps, but if for some reason you can't go to FISA because of time... uh, restrictions, you can start the wiretap and you have 48 to 72 hours, depending on the circumstances, to actually then go to the court and say, is it okay that we did this? And the, the court is supposed to be staffed, you know, with enough people that, in fact, this can be done on a regular basis. So this whole warrantless wiretapping thing um, is kind of BS to uh, be polite about it. Um, and related, because we're just full of warrant information on this uh, bullet point here, is Kylia. Now, Kylia was a legislation put into effect in the late 80s, early 90s, I forget precisely when, but it mandates that all telecommunication providers must design their networks to allow the FBI or any law enforcement to wiretap from a central point in each uh, central office to make it easier for them to do that. And you have to do it at the expense, the telecom providers have to do it at their own expense to do that architecture and that design. And I believe that is actually up for renewal in the next year or so, so... uh, if you're not too happy about that, I, I suggest you contact your uh, Congress critters. A question? Yes. Um, wasn't Kalia uh, supposed to be only for broadband and stuff? Uh, all network So Kalia was originally for, sure, about that. sure. So Kalia was actually for voice traffic and is still yeah. for voice traffic. That's why they put it to broadband due to what's IP. Right. And now they're trying to actually alter Kalia to account for voice over IP. Um, it does so. The traditional voice over IP providers, um, so like AT and T, um, Sprint, and those folks actually have voice over IP options you can subscribe to. Particularly if you're a big corporation, a lot of folks tend to route things over their wireless back, their uh, IP backbones. And in that case, you still need to provide kylia like functionality for law enforcement. Now, the case of like Vonage or folks like that who provide pure voice over IP, 
they don't fall under a Kylia because they're not technically telecommunications providers under the law. So they're looking to extend uh, Kylia to include folks like Skype and Vonage and folks like that. And then there's, that whole, there's a whole class and there's dozens upon dozens of these companies out there right now who don't have to fall under that. Oh, by the way, um, yeah, so if you have questions, feel free to ask them anywhere uh, in the middle of the talk. You don't need to wait till the end. Okay, I've got a question. We'll go back to HIPAA. Yes. And that's to keep our information, medical information, et cetera, private. Correct. <laughs> our hospital uses our social security number as the identification on all our medical records. How do they get away with it? <laughs> Yeah, they don't. Yeah, that that uh, well. So HIPAA is kind of a it's kind of a weird beast. It doesn't actually say anything about your social security number. It just says that you're supposed to follow best practices. Now, the fact of the matter is, under there's a variety of legislation that says they shouldn't be using your social security number. So, in fact, um, I would bring you know I bring that up with the hospital system. They should be issuing other unique identifiers that are not social security number based. But you'll notice from as a result of HIPAA. Um, your health insurance cards that you get in the mail no longer have your social security number on them, or if they do, it only has a portion of it because there's legislation that's in effect in most states now that say you can't use your social security number as a, a, um, on anything that's publicly you know, viewable. So the idea of it not being on your health insurance card is that, well, you know, someone can look over your shoulder if your wallet gets stolen, you don't want your social security number getting lost. But there's nothing that specifically says the hospital internally can't use that number um, they, but in some states, if you request it, they actually have to use something else. But nothing stops them from using that as the default. Well, they've been told about it, and they refuse to answer questions. Talk to me afterwards. I might be able to help you out a little bit. Any other questions right now? I thought I stuck up other hands. Just, just a comment. Um, regarding HIPAA, there's only really two sections of it that really apply to most companies. The first section is if you have a, a breach of medical information, it's up to a $10,000 fine per record. The second half of it is you have to have X policies in place. So when an auditor comes in, they basically go through an audit, check, audit checklist and say, do you have this policy? You know, is it enforced? It doesn't say that you, they have to protect your social security number. It just they have a policy that says it will be protected. So when you send that HIPAA document, all you're doing is saying, I, I admit, to I know you have policies regarding this. It really has no teeth to it at all. It's just a number of people who get a hold of those papers. Right. I mean, that's the. I mean, that's one of the problems. Yeah, but that's one of the problems with HIPAA. And to be you know, to be certified compliant with HIPAA, you just need to you know demonstrate that you have a process and policies that you follow consistently. If you consist, if you tell your auditors, we consistently throw these in the trash every single time, they say, great, you have a process. You're following the process. It's like you know the old ISO 9600 certifications. As long as you say, here's what I'm, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I do it, and here's the proof that I'm doing it. Great, you're golden. It doesn't actually say anything about the quality of the process itself, or how you know the quality of the end product coming out the door, or how secure or how private you, you actually are. It just says that you've made a, a public statement of what you're doing and that you're following it consistently. Okay. Um, so the other thing, so the other thing about HIPAA is that for the most part, it actually doesn't even have. There really aren't a lot of fines around. Uh, this information, and in fact, recently, um, California passed, in addition to its uh, uh, breach notification laws that now put medical records and health insurance information under the same breach notification laws as your, personal inf as your general personal information did as of five years ago. So if, you know, if any hospital or insurance company or anyone else who handles that sort of information loses that data, they also have to send you a letter notifying you. And the, the general best practice has become that they also provide free credit monitoring, though that's not actually legally binding in any of the state laws right now. It's just sort of become the general practice of what you know, companies are supposed to do to show that they're contrite. So I, you know, I alluded to uh, PCI earlier. So PCI, like I said, it's for, uh, it was mandated by Visa and MasterCard as a... Uh, as a process that you know, the company is supposed to put in place to help protect credit card information. Really, it's about, you know, they say it's about identity theft. It's actually about fraud. It's, a, you know, it's an effort from the credit card companies to push down their effort to make sure that they're not losing very much money due to fraud. 
and they're pushing it down to the retailers to make their, you know, so it's taking this effort off of Visa and MasterCard, and they can go to the retailers and say, if you haven't done this, we don't have to pay for fraud that comes out of your business, you know, it comes out of your pocket. Uh, so basically, you know, this is sort of a high-level overview here. I'm not going to read the, all the bullets to you. Um, you can do that yourself, of what retailers need to go through. Um, and, you know, from a sort of enterprise perspective, this is all things that company, you know, the larger companies are doing or should be doing today anyway. Um, so where it really hurts a lot of companies are the smaller, you know, the smaller mom-and-pop businesses that aren't used to doing that. You know, they have one cash register, you know, maybe. You know, they have, you know, and they have like the one cash register and the one zip strip, and they have five employees, and they have to follow more or less the same requirements as, you know, McDonald's and General Electric and eBay. And so it's, um, there's, a lot of being, there's been a lot of pushback from the smaller vendors um, on this legislation saying that it's not being implemented fairly or evenly, and it's putting them at a great disadvantage in the general marketplace. Um, but the, I mean, and the main thing here in terms of privacy is that it's more defining than probably any of the other privacy legislation out there on what, on what people should be doing. And so from that perspective, it's actually a good thing. It's really educating people on what the sort of, you know, not really state of the art, but what, you know, at what a base level people should be doing and thinking about. Um, but it's a little too specific, so it makes it really hard for people to do things in a, what makes sense for their business uh, rationality. So Canada, so that was, you know, we've, that's, that's pretty much the U.S. there. Um, Canada has um, both federal and territorial privacy laws here. I'm not going to go into too much detail, um, but feel free to hit me up afterwards. I have a bunch, of, I have a bunch more information about that. But basically, um, there's the Privacy Act, which affects federal, federal um, agencies and basically says what they can and can't do with uh, your private information and also says... Um, that the, if you contact the federal government in Canada, they, you actually, they actually have to tell you what information they have, what private information yours they have, and how they're using it. And you have the right to correct it. So if they have you know, wrong credit information for you, you're, you know, the wrong, uh, whatever the equivalent of the social security number in Canada is, that sort of thing, um, you have the right to correct that and to find out what they have on you. Um, this is, it's not like um, the Freedom of Information Act, where they, you know, you're going to get your, you know, your dossier, but it is going to tell you the basic, you know, information they have from you in terms of taxes and things like that. Um, then there's a PIPETA, or the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, which is much more in the line of the U.S. Privacy Act, where, which uh, combined with um, some of this breach notification type stuff, where it says, here's the list of things that companies may you know, carry about you, what, what, what types of data they may collect, and how they may use it. Um, specifically, what, we, what they have, and we don't have in the U.S., is that if they collect personal data from you for a, for a particular goal, like they say, we're collecting this information so we can do demographics on, our use, in, uh, on who is using our products so we can better focus it for marketing, they can't use it for anything else. They can only use it specifically for the lists of things they tell you that they're going to use it for, um, which is actually kind of cool. So you can actually make a you know, better decision as opposed to here in the U.S. where traditionally when you giving your personal information, you're signing a way that they can use that data any way you want, unless you go the effort of filling out one of those little privacy forms that came from your financial provider or your healthcare provider saying, no, you can't share it with subsidiaries, partners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then usually there's ways around that anyway. Um, and then the, um, this guy, uh, David Frazier, he's a privacy lawyer in Canada. He has a really great blog about information about international privacy law um, and legislation, things like that. So if it's something you, you know, you care about or have, you know, want to track, he's the guy to follow, um, especially for stuff related to, uh, obviously, to Canada. But he also follows um, most of Asia as well as chunks of Europe since they tend to, uh, a lot of the folks are following Canada's lead in that regard. So, uh, you know, for a while now, uh, Europe had a uh, piece of legislation in place called the European Data Directive, which has been, was probably the first really big privacy law anywhere in the world that said, you can't export European citizens' data out of Europe without their explicit permission. And furthermore, um, even if they give you explicit permission, they can revoke that permission at any time. Which is kind of cool, you know, from a personal perspective, but from a business perspective, it gets kind of exciting at times, because it pretty much means that anyone who is a customer, if you run a U.S.-based business and you have customers in Europe, at some point they can call you up and say, I want you to go through all your records and remove all my personal information, and you have to comply. 
So it can, you know, from a business perspective, it can get pretty exciting, but from, you know, from a personal European citizen's per, uh, perspective, it's really awesome. And in fact, Google is being currently investigated um, because the way they tend to share some of the information they collect from you back and forth through their data centers um, is a possible violation of the European Data Directive given the way that the current terms of service are written for, through Google. So they're currently being investigated by the EU for violations into that. And pretty much this is going to be true for any major corporation that's doing business with end users. Um, Google's just the most notable one because everyone's heard of them. In the UK now, um, there's a, it's a voluntary law called the UK Data Storage Law. They're very imaginative with their names over there sometimes. And basically, what it does is it tells ISPs um, they can volunteer to collect um, data about what emails are going back and forth. Uh, who it's from, who it's to, the size of the email, the date, the subject line, that's it. Nothing about the actual, con the internal contents of the email isn't being collected. And that's also supposed to be collected and stored for up to three years, not just for emails, but also for websites hit, for phone calls, things like that. Now, the rub is that it is voluntary, except for if you don't volunteer to do it, the UK government can step in and enforce you to do it. So it's, they say it's voluntary, um, but it's not really voluntary if they don't want you to do it. Um, and then in Belgium, just uh, this past uh, fall, they passed a, a law that says you can't videotape people publicly. If you, know, if you want to put security cameras out, you actually have to have a cute little icon indicating that there is a video camera there. And where it is, so you, you can't have hidden cameras um, in public, on public streets. I mean, if you like, wander through New York or LA or parts of San Francisco, businesses have cameras all over the place. And if you look for them, you can see them hanging off buildings and whatnot. Well, in Belgium now, you can't do that unless you have the cute little picture of the camera on the wall pointing directly where the camera is. And you need to have a public commissioner whose job it is to, the, to interact with customers so you can call up and say, you know, I was walking by your bank. I want to know if you have footage of me or not. Now, you can't force them to delete it, but they at least have to go through and tell you whether it's there or not. And they're only allowed to store that for 30 days. And the only people who are allowed to view that tape are the security staff for security-related incidents that might happen. So they just can't be watching it. They actually have to have a reason to go back and look at it. Or law enforcement under the equivalent of a warrant. Yes? Yeah. That's a good question. So the question was that if you know the data was actually held longer than 30 days and it shows evidence of a crime that you committed, whether that that's admissible in court, uh, I don't know. Uh, the law has only been in place for the last you know six months, so I don't know if it's a, it, to the best of my knowledge it has not yet been tested in court. Um, it does you know the police do require a warrant. Um, to actually get access to that data and things like that. So it's definitely an interesting question. Given my European, I might add to comment, I'm pretty sure you can't do this in court. Yeah, thank you. Let's say 99% for sure. I would certainly hope that was the case. Okay, so Japan. This one I need my notes for. So Japan has this, uh, the Personal Information Protection Law, which is somewhat based on Canada's law. They looked at Canada heavily when uh, putting this law into practice. And what it does is, it actually just went into effect uh, about a year ago, April 1st. And so what it says is that um, this applies to any company that has 5,000, that has inf private information on 5,000 people, and that includes both internal employees as well as outside customers. So, you know, pretty much almost any decent-sized company in Japan falls under this. And it mandates that the company have a chief privacy officer of some sort on staff. And they have to, you have to do, uh, state why you're collecting personal data, and um, you have to get consent for any future use, for any future use beyond the, um, the reason it was stated for in the, um, on the original forms that we, where you requested the data. And um, so you also have to, you know, like Canada and like a lot of Asia, there needs to be a process in place for correcting any errors in the data, which is, again, something we don't have in the U.S. Not that I'm bitter about that or anything. And if they fail to comply with the law, um, fines of up to $3,000 U.S. and uh, the equivalent of that, obviously, in Japanese currency, and six months in jail for the person actually responsible for managing that data. 
And I, that's probably the, the, the part that's actually the most uh, compelling of this legislation in terms of people who have to, uh, who have to follow it. I think you know, $3,000 for most companies wouldn't uh, make them blink. But uh, six months in jail for the person responsible for the data is probably uh, an attention getter, I think. So in Australia, they have a slew of different legislation. I'm not going to uh, really get into that right now. But um, basically what we have is that there's different legislation that covers private businesses, the, fed the government um, as well, and then there's a separate list for healthcare providers. So right now there's a huge effort going on to consolidate this legislation, trying to make it a little more uniform because it's just, you know, it's very confusing for everyone, for, it's con for the, not just the consumers, but the government officials aren't quite sure what they need to do. Healthcare providers, as I said, have their own little piece they need to do. And the various territories in Australia also all have their own legislation. So it makes the U.S. stuff look really simple and clean compared to what's going on in Australia right now. Um, so they're making some huge efforts, and there's a number of committees who, are, who have been providing comments, especially in the last year, over things that Australia can do. Uh, to make things a little more uniform. But on the list of uh, potential uh, ideas, they were talking about extending um, do not call lists to include things like right now, they have a, the equivalent of a US do not call list, um, but it only applies to landlines, and they're looking to extending that to uh, cell phones and fax machines, and also to email as well. But right now, that's not in place. Um, and additionally, there was one other thing that I wanted to mention. Oh, right now in Australia, if companies do less than $3 million a year in business, they're currently exempt from the legislation, and they're looking at lowering that number to a much, to a much smaller number, like a $1 million or $750,000. Um, as companies have been growing at a faster rate, they want to make sure that they're getting people in the right uh, frame uh, that way. Uh, there's been a lot of effort to produce uh, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperative, which was sort of an international group um, similar to the EU, but much looser to come up with privacy legislation for them that they could sort of, it's really a recommendation more than anything else. Um, and recently, about uh, six months ago, there was a, uh, an academic in New Zealand. He went through and basically tore this, their framework to shreds because every single one of the member states of the organization had much stricter privacy law than were being recommended by the consortium itself. Um, which some of I think says more about how the organization was run, that, you know, that everyone in there has stricter laws than they're recommending that other people follow. And also, several pieces of the, uh, of the framework are in direct conflict with European data legislation, which means that it would make, if anyone were to actually sign up and follow those rules by the, by the letter of the framework, that it would be incredibly hard to do business between the UK and the rest of Europe and Australia. Um, and considering that Australia in particular, but any of the Asia PEC uh, corporations, several of them, I'm sorry, cooperatives, um, since several of them are Commonwealth countries of the UK, it would make things particularly exciting for them. Okay, so the real question is, you know, as you know, in the business in the business world, how do you make this work? You know, how do you actually get your companies to be a little more privacy aware? How do you uh, make it? You know, make privacy work and not kill the business in the process. It sounds complicated, and if you are actually in a position to actually do something, it's not nearly as bad as it sounds. It's really more just a question of doing a lot of legwork. Uh, I did this at my previous employer, and we thought, oh, this would be easy. You know, we have executive sign off. And we have lots of people from all the business units who are interested in doing this, so we should be able to you know, knock this sucker out in like three months. Piece of cake, no problem. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> we quickly found out. Now, we, uh, I would, this company was, it was very centralized. All the applications were being run by information technology. There was only five major applications. We thought, really, how hard can this be? It's not like some of our competitors who have 1,000 applications, 1,500 applications. In one case, 10,000 applications. We have a pretty good grasp of the idea where data is going. So we started going out interviewing sales and alliances and tech support and engineering. We suddenly discovered that we had data on our customers going all over the place. Particularly in the case of alliances and sales, we had got lots of conferences that we ran or participated in. It turned out there were all sorts of contractual agreements with these organizations for sharing leads and for, show, for sharing attendee information. And we act, in some cases, uh, we discovered that that was actually in violation of European 
or Canadian or Asia PAC law, so we actually had to go in and renegotiate contracts to bring ourselves within compliance. Um, but really it came down to these four bullet points is, you know, where do you do business? The most important question is which laws do you care about or do, which laws do you really need to care about? And so the first question you need to find out is, you know, where do you have offices? Where are you, and more importantly, where are your customers so you know, you know, which list of laws you need to worry about to begin with? And then it turns out also that some of this privacy law depends on where money is actually going. So in, in the UK, tax laws are different in, in Germany versus Ireland versus England versus France. And so some of the privacy law also affects that. So you need to know where's the money going, how's it being handled within the company, so you can make sure you're following the right financial laws as well as privacy laws. And then, of course, once you know where you're doing business and where the money going is, the question is, where's the data coming from and where's it going? This is where it got complicated, even with our small little set of applications. Um, and then the real uh, success in doing this is most companies today already have major compliance efforts because of Sarbanes-Oxley and the aforementioned GLBA, HIPAA, things like that, that cost them significant money, even if it's just in sales, and not being able to say they're compliant. So leverage those efforts. A lot of this legwork is already being done to build policies and process, and it's not a lot of effort to add a little more on top of that to get your privacy stuff in line. And the other thing is you need to partner with you know, legal, HR, all these folks who are, who are really touching this data on a regular basis to make sure that their stuff is all in line. And fortunately, there's the, these folks, Unified Compliance, who have gone through and figured out all the major pieces of legislation in the US and around the world, and it made a, it's actually like five or 10 page Excel spreadsheet that you can download that shows all the typical controls companies use. Um, cross-referenced with the appropriate legislation so you can actually take this, you know, go to your privacy officer or your compliance officer or your auditor or all three and say, you know, as it's, it's a great tool. It helped us out a lot. Was there a question in the back? Oh, okay. Um, and use that to uh, make sure you're not, you know, you're not being redundant in your efforts. Um, and this way you can make sure that privacy-related work that other people are probably already doing uh, will get you where you need to go. Okay, future, okay, so yes, yeah, so it turns out, you know, here the U.S. Is, uh, has been actually fairly groundbreaking in terms of data breach notification. It's actually the first country to start notifying people explicitly that their data has been uh, compromised and potentially exposed to um, malicious folks, whether it's internal people or outside people to the company, and to the point where now in the United Kingdom, uh, a group of uh, retailers has gotten together and is pushing for a similar law in the U.K., and about six, eight months ago, the government of the UK actually lost information on something like 25 million citizens. And even though there was nothing in place to mandate that they do that, uh, there's been enough public pressure for this sort of thing to happen when companies or governments lose data that they actually publicly disclose that they had lost this information on all these people. Uh, fortunately, about a month and a half ago, that data was actually found, the DVDs were actually located inside, underneath the keyboard of a lost laptop that someone got at a pawn shop. Um, so they're fairly certain that data didn't really leak out there at all, but nonetheless, they did follow what is uh, increasingly becoming uh, a best practice on notifying people, even though there wasn't the legal stuff in place. Um, I already talked about US vendors um, pushing back on the PCI compliance efforts, especially around the storage of this information. It's just really uh, making things more difficult. Yes? So um, the, the laws differ from state to state on when they need to notify you. Um, usually, the, generally it's supposed to be within 30 to 60 days. However, any time the police or the FBI are involved, they're allowed to tell the corporation to sit on it and to be quiet about it until uh, the investigation is complete or at a state where um, it will not, you know, it will not uh, impair the investigation if that information gets out. In a lot of cases, um, the information that was that was lost or stolen is still an ongoing effort by these hackers in the pejorative sense, of course. Um, so they don't want to actually, well, the uh, well, the criminals are in, in fact still performing this act. They want to have the time to track them down and, and actually catch them, as opposed to just getting them to stop. So sometimes, the uh, FBI, or the police will ask you to hold off on notifying people until they can get to a point in the investigation where um, it's safe to uh, where we'll put that uh, investigation at risk. 
And I mentioned uh, earlier there was some uh, privacy legislation going on in the government um, at the federal level, and this the most notable one is the Leahy Specter ID theft bill, which actually died in committee at the end of 2007 and is uh, supposed to be revived this year, but uh, so far I haven't seen anything about that yet. And that's pretty much it. Uh, now is um, open for more questions, and uh, hopefully I'll even have answers for you. I got this letter, and here's this, and after that, good luck. I don't. Okay, so um, basically, the question was, you know, uh, the gentleman. You, presumably, you used to work for the state of Ohio in some capacity, or still do? No. Okay, you were okay. Um, so uh, last year, about six nine months ago, the uh, the state of Ohio uh, had a laptop be stolen. It was actually a contractor to the state. It was an intern who uh, had information on something like a million former employees of the state, which would include anyone who worked for one of the Ohio State universities or anything like that. Uh, and they it lost um, their names, addresses, phone numbers, social security numbers, um, which is actually probably what actually generated, caused them to generate the letter, and in some case, some other personal information, possibly some credit history stuff, depending on if that was gathered in a background check before employment. Um, separately, also about the same time, Ohio State University lost a bunch of data on uh, past applicants and students and staff and faculty. Um, in both cases, letters were sent out to all the affected people. And in both cases also, they worked with uh, different companies to provide free credit monitoring. And what that's supposed to do is allow you to monitor your credit through the, major th the three major credit agencies, Experian, TransUnion, and whatever the other one is. Um, so you can you know, basically, if anyone tries to open credit in your name, like say open up a new credit card or buy a house or you know, buy a car on credit or something like that, it's supposed to uh, generate a report to you, so call you up yeah. and say, is this really you? Right. Um, they don't have to do this. It's sort of become, like I said, the best practice and what companies do to, notify, um, to actually provide some credit monitoring. Um, from what they've seen so far, generally if, this, if some sort of fraud is going to happen as a result of that information being lost, it's going to be in the first year which is sort of why people have been going for a year. Um, I would certainly encourage you to continue going with some sort of service. Um, I'm a subscriber to one I can tell you afterwards. Um. There's been some discussion about it. It's, uh, I still think the privacy efforts, despite, you know, realistically they've been going on for like 15, 20 years now at various levels, are still young enough in the process that um, the priorities here in the U.S. are very different than the ones in Asia and very different than the ones in Europe still. So I don't think that international level there's really going to be anything for quite a while. There have been some things put in place. So in the case of the European Data Directive, there's a couple of methodologies you can use that let you export data from the UK to Europe, uh, from the from Europe and the UK to the US without invoking you know personal authentic you know authorization from each individual consumer at the other end. And there's a couple of different ways you can go about doing that. Um, one's called Safe Harbor, where basically 
uh, you get someone in a couple different organizations out there to certify that you are, you know, technically compliant with, um, you know, you have the process and technology in place to handle European data directive information at a comfort level equivalent to what companies inside Europe do. And then they say, okay, we acknowledge that, you know, you Oracle or, you know, you General Electric, you know, have good enough practices in place that will let you export the data from Europe to the U.S. without getting consent from each individual consumer. Um, well, the cre well, it, it, it is complimentary to credit cards since the credit card agencies do their best to determine when fraud's going on and call you after the fact. But the credit card agencies aren't going to call you and say, "Did you really, you know, try to have a new Visa card?" Or you know, if you like, when I, you know, or like you could call up, right? If you have my social security number, my mother's maiden name, and a couple other pieces of information, you could call up, you know, AT and T and say, "I want a new cell phone, a new contract," and they will happily give it to you using my personal information. Um, and the credit, card, the credit card agencies aren't going to catch that. They're not looking for that. Um, and, you know, certainly, you know, the folks like Experian and TransUnion, the actual credit agencies offer similar services. But considering that, you know, they haven't been protecting the information very well to begin with, I wouldn't really trust them. You know, why should we pay them extra money to do something that they're already supposed to be doing and not doing a very good job of anyway? Any other questions? Yeah, we see a lot of the... Uh Phishing attacks and uh, credit card attacks coming from like, Central America, South America, Russia, um, even China to some degree, and North Korea. Uh, what kind of things are going on there? I mean, you talked about the United States, Europe, mm -hmm. and the Pan Asian area. But what kind of things are going on in those? There's not a lot going on there right now, um, which is one of the reasons you're seeing that. Also, in general, um, law, there's the legal state of computer crime is very loose or non-existent in a lot of those countries, which is another reason that a lot of the stuff is, is originating out of there. You know, in a lot of cases, the actual people doing it are somewhere else in the world, but they're launching the attacks from these countries because they don't have extradition agreements with the U.S., or it's not actually even illegal in those countries to be you know, doing those sorts of, you know, what are crimes here, it's not illegal for, in, in there, so. That's the real reason a lot of that stuff is coming from those places. Okay, well, thank you very much. of this information loose mm -hmm. on us, yet on a lower level, when you go to a school district, they won't tell the teachers which student has a heart problem or which student has a Yeah, every, all the presenters get copies. What kind of format? It's in DVD. Okay. Ooh. Good. Yeah, you can just uh, leave that up there. Leave it back here, I guess. I don't know if I'm going to Cool, thank you. Well, 